And the scripture says in Jeremiah, what does it say? It literally says it. He is going to come and redeem us and restore them to himself so that we can call him Jehovah Sidkin. We can still call him that today because he is Jehovah Sidkenu. He saw our brokenness and restored us. Hello, hello. Elevated melon. That's a, uh, sound like an anointing, Pastor. Uh, <laughs> Doesn't come by the laying on the hands, though. All right. The, <laughs> All righty. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I, I beg, Pastor, not to do intros. So just, just let me walk. It's so embarrassing. All right. <laughs> the he and Zach get a get a kick out of it. All right. So we're talking the last few weeks we we have been actually a number of weeks we have been talking about the names of God yeah. all righty so as we're listening to these names listening to the messages going and doing the digging yourself cuz like reading rainbow levar burton says don't just take my word for it go <laughs> digging it up you look it up for yourself and what it says there one of the ones we've done thus far is what number week 1 Jehovah Rohi if I'm saying that right, or Rohi, or make sure I'm saying it correctly, the Lord our shepherd. Uh, oh, ja, give me one second, sorry about that. Do, do, do. There we go, just had to start my timer, apologies. <laughs> uh, Jehovah Rohi, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer, okay? Jehovah M Kadesh, or M Kadeshkim, the Lord our sanctifier, the one who sets us apart for himself. And Jehovah Shama and Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is present, and the Lord our peace. Now, as we go through these, we're going to talk about another one today, and we're going to talk about it even more after today. But as we go through these, and as I've, I was listening to the sermons and studying um, for myself, and through the years when I've heard these things and studied the sermons for myself, <clears throat> I've noticed a few things, two things more specifically. One, that these weren't just nicknames that the, that the Israelites were giving to God. This wasn't just monikers like calling him the man upstairs or uh, the big guy in the sky or things like this. They weren't just like giving him nicknames. They were identifying what they saw him to be. So like they noticed, wait, this is what he keeps doing. So I'm going to call him what I see him keep doing. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I finally resigned and retired from Verizon. I mean, it's not technically retirement, but I'm never going back. Uh, but <laughs> no disrespect. If you have them, they're a solid company, okay? Uh, but the, uh, uh, I noticed, like, in about the seventh month, they started calling me Unk. And I'm like, how old am I that these kiddies <laughs> start calling me Unk, you know? And it was funny because I would say something, they're like, oh, there's another Percyism. I say something else, there's another Percyism. And I'm noticing that it's like they notice the things that I would say, they would give me titles based off what they saw me do and how they saw me act. Matter of fact, the, the manager one time came in and said, Percy, if somebody ever came in the store and said that you lied to them about their bill, I would call them a liar in their face. He said, because I know you how much you hate lying. And I do. I hate lying. So I wouldn't lie to them. But they could say that to me, not because I went around saying, I hate lying, I hate lying, I hate lying. I didn't say that to them. But I lived it. And so therefore, they saw it based off of my life. I'm not perfect. I'm imperfect. But I hate lying. And so they saw that, and they was like, oh, yeah, we know Percy didn't lie about it. Matter of fact, a customer came in once, this is years ago, and said, Percy lied to me. And all my coworkers said, out loud, no, he didn't. <laughs> no, he didn't. The guy was like, yeah, you're right. I was just trying to see if I can get the bill fixed. <laughs> <laughs> which I took as a compliment, but I thought it was hilarious because I wasn't there that day, okay? Again, I'm not perfect, but I try to live what he does, okay? So when we see it, you name things based on what you see. I guess they saw me as old, so they called me Unk. We see they, they saw him as a shepherd. The second thing I see in this is that not only did they see these things and they call him that, these were all the deficiencies they had that he filled in. 
So while they wandered around in the wilderness in their sin, they needed a shepherd. And what did, what, what did they see him as? Jeho Jehovah Rohi, our shepherd. When they were sick and needed healing in their body, they were like, oh, wait, wait, wait. He's a healer too. And like I grew up in some churches where I heard people say he's a doctor in the sick room. Okay? They saw him the exact same way. When it says the, the next one, the Lord our sanctifier, did he not set Israel apart for himself? And made them the chosen people. And by making them the chosen people, it does not make them better than you or me. But it made them the chosen lineage for the Messiah. Does that make sense? He set them apart. This is the, where I am choosing for the, the Messiah to come through. Doesn't mean that they're the best people on the planet. Because under the, in the eyes of outside of the law, under redemption, we are all equal in the eyes of Christ. And he is no respecter of persons. But he set them apart for the Messiah's lineage. Make sense? And then Jehovah Shammah and Jehovah Shalom, he was always present. Even in the times where he was silent, he was still there. When he walked around for 40 years in the wilderness, their shoes never wore out. They had a pillar of fire in the, in the cold nights in the desert to keep them warm and cover of the shade to keep them cool in, in, during the daytime while they walked around in the circle because of their own foolish choices. <laughs> he was still all of those things for them in peace throughout it. So much that they still greet each other with shalom. So now, going to the next one today, I want to take us to Genesis. We've got to go to the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. I love that musical. My favorite, so if I say it often, it's still my favorite musical. All right, Genesis chapter, actually, I'll just do it like this. Quick recap. Genesis chapter 1, we see 1 through 2, we see God creating everything. The earth was void without, well, the earth was Without form and void, and so darkness covered the earth. God said, let there be light. Bam, light came, because he spoke it. Flipped the switch with his voice. He, he spoke the trees. He spoke the heavens. He spoke the birds. He spoke the fish. He spoke all of these things. But then in Genesis chapter 2, we see in verse, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, okay, or a living soul. So God, I used to do this when I was a kid. I would take Play-Doh, a young person, still in my kids have it. I will still roll Play-Doh out and make something out of it. And you form, I, would, I kind of imagine that's how God did it, okay, except for his was elevated because he made sinews and veins and synapses and coccyx, and all these other things, I know where it is, but it's an amazing name. And all of these other things, you know, your larynx and all these things he created, he fashioned. He saw things that are so complex, like the human eye. Have you ever just stopped and thought about the eye for a second? How intricate it is that it cannot be evolved. It's so perfect it had to be designed. Okay? And it was designed by the designer. And he did all of that and made all of that in us. And then he went even farther than I ever could with my Play-Doh playing. He breathed his breath into man. It doesn't matter how much I, <gasps> on that Play-Doh, it would just be warm. <laughs> nothing else is going to happen. Covered in spit probably, but nothing else is going to happen. Only God breathed his breath into us. But here's the thing. From that point, we have to realize that we became God-dependent. We believe that we are independent. And there is a bit of autonomy. We can walk where we want to walk, go where we want to go, say what we want to say, curse him to his face. So there is a bit of autonomous independence there. But we are still breath dependent on the one who gave us breath. The one who gave us life is still there. And we think, well, past PJ or PJ, whatever you want to call me, I don't care. That was... Thousands of years ago that this happened, 6,000 plus. Man, seriously, how do we still have the same breath? Well, I was talking this, uh, I, I said in the first service, how many of you ever made bread? You know the yeast starter that you use for bread? You can use the same yeast starter over and over and over again. You can take it and pass it on to someone else if you have too much. Matter of fact, the lady stopped me in the, in the foyer afterwards and said, yes, I have one that's over 100 years old that was passed down to her, that she gives to someone else. So if we can pass yeast, 
and we can pass starters for bread. You don't think the breath of life can come down through every human to pass down? It does. It passes through every womb all the way down to us till we get to the tomb. And we pass it to the next person. So the breath we have is the very breath that came from God. And mankind said, hey, you gave me breath, you gave me life, you gave me this earth. In other words, the earth was literally Adam's and Eve's. It was theirs, but it wasn't enough. All the trees, save one, were theirs, but it wasn't enough. Hanging out with God himself, literally talking with him, learning about the universe, getting to name the very first science that ever existed, the, the, the science of naming animals, they did. And guess what? wasn't enough. They wanted more. What did they want? That which they said they couldn't have. Sounds like a lot of marriages. So how about those cowboys? I'm just joking. <laughs> In the South, that's what we say to get out of conversation. So sorry about that. How about the lions? The better one. Sorry. I'm not a Cowboys fan. So all of this stuff happened. God did all of this. Adam and Eve said it's still not enough. They sinned. They did the opposite of what God said. And he came down and said, hey, guys, what happened? And they tried to, if you notice, the scripture said they covered themselves in fig leaves. So in other words, they realized that they were indeed sinful. And they had shame based on their sin, so they tried to cover their shame with fig leaves. They tried to use a natural remedy to cover a spiritual problem. And it didn't work. And what did God have to do? Sacrifice an animal shed the blood to cover them naturally. Because the one that was coming to shed his blood had not yet arrived. So a temporary repair to cover a damning sin. And God said, come on, let's try to fix this. Come on, what did he do? He went to each one of them asking them, hey, hey, where are you? And I talked about this before, so I'll make it fast. When he was asking where are you, he was not asking their geographic location. How do you know that? Because he showed up right where they were. <laughs> so he knew, he knew exactly where they were. He was asking, in essence, where are you in relationship to, with me? Where are we? Kind of like when husbands and wives have fights and they come back and say, hey, where are we right now? They're sitting in front of the person. They talk to them on the phone. They know where they are, but they're asking, hey, where do we stand? Are we in right standing or are we disjointed? So that being said, they still pushed him to the side, spat in his face, and they took the, they took the blame and shoved it. One at him and at others. So what does he do? Okay. Be it unto, thy, unto you which you have asked for, you may leave. And they now were left out of the garden, they left out of the covenant, and they roamed the earth. Thousands of years passed by, all of this stuff, hundreds of years passed by, nations are formed, nations come up, and God decides to build the, the nation of Israel to carve them out, sanctify them, as the sanctifier Jehovah he is, and set them apart so that the line comes out through Jesus. The same Jesus that he actually prophesied as soon as they fell. When the curses were pronounced, in other words, he wasn't cursing them. He was telling them what the consequences of their actions were and what they were going to see because of it. Okay? So he lets them know this is the curse that is now upon you because of your choices. But in that darkness came some light. And he said that snake, the woman's seed will crush your head. Now, I've talked about this before. We know that he was talking about Jesus. How do we know that? Because women do not have seed. They have eggs. So therefore, he's talking about the miraculous supernatural birth coming through a virgin named Mary. He is prophesying Jesus at the point of their fall, saying hope is coming. Okay? Throughout time, we see where throughout the scripture, if you study it, you'll see over and over, he keeps doing it. He keeps giving them over and over signs and things like that. To tell them and remind them till we get to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, when this book is written, God's people were in exile in Babylon. Jerusalem and the temple had been destroyed. God raised up prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and others, who called God's people to repent of their sins and turn back to him. If they did so, God promised to forgive them. Listen to that. If they chose to repent, that means own their choices, say they were wrong, and go back to him and say, God, I messed up. Come to him. The Bible says that he, uh, it talks about how he would forgive them 
and their temple would be rebuilt, and they would once more live in their land in peace and safety. And the kingdom would be restored, and a righteous king of the lineage of David would rule once more. He would be called, let's keep reading. Jeremiah 23, verse 6 says this. A little pause there. Jeremiah 23, verse 6 says this. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 33, verse 14 says this. Actually, I'm going to read verse 16. In those days shall Judah be saved. Uh, I guess I can read 14. Oh, there it is. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. The name we're talking about today is Jehovah Sidkenu, God our righteousness. And what righteousness means there, what righteousness means is the restorer, justice. Let me read it here. It is the justification and restoration of that which is broken to wholeness. That which is lost is replaced. That which is broken is restored. Adam and Eve broke fellowship with God for all mankind. I'm going to tell you right now, if I go into Disney World with my kids, we have a dream to go to Disney World. We, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we have a dream to go to Disney World because I promised the kids when my daughter was like two and now she's 13 and I owe her a trip to Disney World. I have to keep my word, okay? So before she graduates, we're going to Disney World. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she reminds me and we got to go to Disney World. So let's say we go to Disney World. I get in there. I have an issue. Uh, with one of the characters, they step up on me, and, and I don't know, and a goofy, he's feeling froggy, and he wants to jump at me, and he's like, hey, and, yo, and he's like, runs up at me. Do I sit there and take it, or do, you know, do, do I defend my manhood against this inanimate, I mean, this fake character? So let's say we get into a brawl. They're not just going to kick me out. All the Joes that are there that day will be kicked out because of my stupidity fighting with a fake dog. Okay. <laughs> This is what's going to happen. The same thing. Because of one man's sin, all of mankind, whether you ate the fruit or not, all of us sin because of one man's sin. All of us have sin nature and we act it out. From the minute we're kids, how selfish our little blessings can be as they come up. To how selfish we become as adults, we're just more quiet about it and not as loud. So how selfish we become as older adults when we feel like we can say whatever we want and say, because I've earned the right to say what I'm, I'm going to speak my mind. So all of us you live in selfishness of sin. We just call it different things and different labels as we progress through life. However, we needed saving. Because Jesus, God, when he decided, remember, everybody take a deep breath. That's God dependent. But the farther we get from him, the harder it is to breathe. Because oxygen, the oxygen of his spirit comes from him. Like the song says, he's the very air I breathe. And we need to be restored to him who gives us our very breath. So we need to know Jehovah Sidkenu, the one who restores righteously. How do we do that? Go with me, please, to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We know it. We know, we, we've heard it uh, in, in church and in scriptures and t-shirts and things like that, which is great. You should be reminded of the word of God. What does it mean concerning us? 2 Corinthians 5, 17 in the Amplified says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is, grafted in, joined to him by faith, and in, excuse me, in him as Savior, he is a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings a new life. The word here when it says new creature is the word metamorpho, where we get the word metamorphosis. And when we think metamorphosis in nature, what's the one thing most of us think about? The caterpillar going to the butterfly. It is the same internally, but they are two different creatures. 
Same person, different creatures. Okay? Caterpillar, caterpillar couldn't fly. Butterfly don't want to. I mean, don't want to crawl. <laughs> you know what I mean? Two different capacities. One, a capacity of crawling and groveling. The other, soaring, flying in its full beauty. Us, broken, crawling, gasping for air because we've walked away from the supply. Renewed, flying, soaring, up where we belong, like the song goes. The difference is we are the same person, but different creature. Okay? So when we accept him, let's keep reading here. Verse 18, but all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. What is, what is reconciliation? What is a reconcile? If your bank, you have a certain amount of money in the bank, your bank, you go to take it out to go pay for whatever, and you realize you are now negative. How many thousands you have in the bank are not there? You call them, they do a trace and realize that the money somehow got transferred to another account that is maybe one digit off from yours. Okay? So that means it was accidentally put somewhere else. What if you get off the phone with them and you say, all right, cool. Thank you for giving me the information. It's like, all right, no problem. Have a blessed day. And they hang up. No, 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 no. <laughs> to quote Method Man, we're at odds until it gets even. Okay? There is a problem that needs to be reconciled, not just recognized. Just because you know there's beef does not mean you have fixed the beef. Did the 80s commercial come to you all too when you heard that? Am I the only person? Okay, thank you. So God saw the issue and didn't just say, all right, have a blessed day. From the minute, from when they sinned, he presented the plan of reconciliation talking about Jesus. He talks about reconciliation because in Jeremiah, the prophet was talking about Jesus when he called him reconciliation, Jehovah Sidkenu. Because God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are one. Three different ways in function, one in person. And so therefore, God told them he was coming again. All throughout the scripture, we see Jesus. They call it the, the scarlet thread. Through every chapter, uh, excuse me, every book of the Bible, we see Jesus. God is constantly reminding, he's coming. I'm sending reconciliation. And we are not reconciled with that bank until they put the money back. If you get, I, I, even more fun, if you order a pizza and it shows up two slices missing, you pay for all 12. Two slices are there. Do they not owe you your two slices? Oh, you are content because the driver's like, yo, I couldn't find your house. <laughs> Got a little hungry. <laughs> Got that from Betty's Hills. Got a little hungry. Ate it. Well, you'd be like, now you could be kind hearted and be like, you know what, bro? Go with God and with pepperoni. Enjoy. And I respect that. Ma'am, you look hungry. You can have more. You can, go, I have no problem. Be that kind. However, are we not going to call the people? We probably won't even blame them. They're probably not getting paid enough anyway. We'll call the company and be like, hey, this came. I need my pizza. Sir, your pizza came to you. It did, but short of what belongs there. I paid for this. This is what I received. When we don't walk in the reconciliation, Jesus paid for wholeness. We walk outside of it. He's not getting his money's worth. He's not getting all of what his blood paid for. And the scripture says here that he reconciled us to himself through Christ. What does that mean when it says he reconciled us to himself? It didn't cost you anything. It cost him everything. So the reconciliation that is required, reconciliation is not an option. If we are to be with him forever, if we are to accept Christ and be with him in heaven, because I'm going to say this, I know I say this often, but I'm going to say it over and over again because it's something we need to, we need to deal with, something that we need to talk about. God sends no one to hell. I, keep, I hear this often, and I'm not saying this with any anger or animosity, however, or any animus at all, but I hear this over and over. How can a good God send good people to hell? First of all, how do we get to decide who's good and who's not? It's subjective. Because Hitler thought he was doing good. Mussolini thought he was doing good. 
Pol Pot thought he was doing good. Stalin thought he was doing good. Correct? Okay. Bernie Madoff thought he was doing good for himself, but he thought he was doing good. However, we would argue that none of those things were good because we know there is an absolute standard of what goodness is and theirs wasn't it. Correct? So, how can we say, how can a good God send good people to hell? First of all, that's the first thing. Who's good? Haven't we all screwed up in some way or another today? So, if that's the case, this good God, who is the standard of good, knows when we want him and when we don't. And he presents himself to us. He sends us sweet people that meet us in the store and say, hey, do you know Jesus loves you? People give us tracks. We'll find a track on our window in our car, and we'll hit the windshield wiper and let it fly off in the breeze. Get that mess off my car. I don't want that. We have people tall as we get called calls from grandma and said, baby, don't forget Jesus loves you. Okay, grandma, I know. We, we, we wake up in the middle of the night and somebody's preaching on TV. And we sit there for a second and think, I should listen to this. No, nah, and turn it over. He keeps sending us flowers, candy, all of these things trying to woo us. But, but gentlemen, can I ask you a question? When you're trying to talk to this lady... And you're trying all these things. You're trying to be nice. You're trying all these things to woo her and all of this stuff. And she's like, no. <laughs> if you continue to pursue, first of all, I don't believe the notebook. It was toxic. <laughs> There's a sacred cow. Pow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Very... <laughs> Woo. These lots of lights are hot. A, a lot of these movies are very toxic because they show it's all works based. It's all, you're having to earn someone's love. And we take that and we superimpose that onto God. Right? And we think, i got to do this. Well, he's the one knocking. And fellas, if we're trying to meet this lady and trying to talk to her, and she's like, no, if we force the issue, now it becomes kidnapping, abuse, rape, and everything else. So now it goes to illegal. And ladies, if you reject him, which you're welcome to do, if he's not, if he, no thank you, I have no desire, I'm good. How many times before you like, leave me alone? For restraining orders are filed. God is the same way. If he keeps offering you himself, he is not going to force himself on you. He reconciled you through Christ and he offers it as a free gift. If you say no, he allows you to live in the choices, the consequences of your choices. Because all heaven is, is eternity with him. Hell is eternity without him. So if that's the case, if you didn't want him here, he's not going to force you into eternity with someone you didn't want here. Because that would be hell for you. So he will honor your choice for eternity. But I didn't know. Yes, you do. We all know. Because the evidence is clear. All right? So, he reconciled us to himself, making, through Christ, making us acceptable to him, and to give us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, verse 19, reconciling the world to himself, not accounting people's sins against them, but canceling them. So, in other words, he knew what Adam and Eve did. He knew what Jeremiah prophesied. He knew all of these things. It says humanity is going to need to be reconciled from what Adam and Eve did. Their parents, the first one screwed up. The second Adam has to come to fix it. And the Bible says that he thought it not something so huge to get off of his throne in heaven to come down to become a slave and die for us. So in other words, he saw you as worthy to die for. Uh, a person, uh, once I was at a grocery store, and I, uh, I opened the door for someone. The Holy Spirit said, tell them they're worth opening the door for. And I know I was at a gas station. I opened up the door, and I said, and the Holy, I said you're worth opening the door for. And so I went to go pump my gas. I said, man, thank you. He came back onto the pump, and he was like, no, seriously, I needed that. And I said, God loves you so much, he'd have some random guy tell you at a gas pump how much he loves you. Even more than that, holding a door to someone to show them how valuable it is, is one thing. 
dying in your place to show you how valuable you are is far better. He, I, I got to say this, God is not into fake titles. He is not into self-grandizing. He is not into putting him up somewhere that he does not deserve. Okay? Doesn't the scripture say, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good? Don't just take my word that I'm good. Try me. So, we can, the scripture says in Jeremiah, what does it say? It literally says it. He is going to come and redeem us and restore them to himself so that we can call him Jehovah Sidkenu. We can still call him that today. Because he is Jehovah Sidkenu. He saw our brokenness and restored us. My brother, come here. I think I'm always doing this with you. <laughs> so let's say we are disjointed because he is there and I am here. But I'm not lording that above him because he belongs here with me. He stepped off the steps. So now what I do is I bridge the gap as Jesus and lay myself like this down over here so he can step up on me back up to where I put him in the first place. Does not the scripture say that we are seated in heavenly places? Does that mean we're below the throne or sitting with him? But that only comes through restoration. What is righteousness? Restoring what was broken to its original state. Like the Japanese art of kintsugi, a broken pot, broken. It is repaired with gold, and now that pot is more valuable after it's been broken and repaired than it even was before it broke because of the gold laced in the pieces and because of the pieces. Mind you, you can't eat cereal just in shards of gold, <laughs> but you can in the pieces of the bowl. But the milk stays when it's sealed. So therefore, when God restores us, now we can fellowship. Now, we could have fellowshiped there, and God indeed talked to humanity throughout the ages when we were broken. But how much easier is it to communicate and talk about how good the Knicks are playing? Because they are. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, brother. We have an opportunity. We have a God that loves us equally, no man or woman above each other. He loves us all. And provided for us all. So what do you do? You have to accept what he gave. And I'm going to say this in three minutes. <laughs> so I'm going, I'm turning on my New Jersey speed out of my Louisiana now. <laughs> the scripture says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do we know that that's the truth? Because that's the same thing he did in Genesis when he went to Adam and Eve after they sinned and asked them what's going on. He gave them a chance to admit it, to own it, to correct it, but they didn't. We're the same way. Haven't I talked about, haven't we talked about it here in this church that what Christianity is not just a religion, it's an intimate marriage between you and Christ? Sorry, my alarm keeps going off. <laughs> I have to make it silent next time. It is, uh, please, thank you. <laughs> I knew a man had hands. I appreciate it. It's my brother. So it is an intimate marriage between you and Christ. He is the groom. We are the bride. Anybody that chooses to accept him in his hand that he gives out now becomes his spouse. Correct? And we are adopted into God's family because we married his kid. Make sense? So that being said, that being said, if you and your spouse have beef, and you sinned against your spouse, do you get to just come back in the house and be like, all right, we good? I'm going to tell you right now, if I cheat on my wife and I commit betrayal, because cheating is such an easy, light word, it's, a whole, it's, it's devastating, life-ripping betrayal. If I betray my wife like that, then guess what? I don't get to just walk back up in the house and be like, hey, we good? We good? Because in the black community, those two words, we good, mean like 17 different things. So I'd be like, we good. We good. That's not how that works. What I have to do is own my crap. Say I did it. And then say, will you forgive me? And what can I do to reconcile what has been broken? 
If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The only way, only way to God to accept what he's done for us is to own that we are broken. Shoot, the only way to be successful in Alcoholics Anonymous is to indeed first say, I'm an alcoholic. If you're not willing to own that, you will never get rid of what you're not willing to let go of. And if I'm not willing to let go own my crap and say, Jesus, I am a broken man, I need you. Then therefore we will never, ever, ever be reconciled. Ever. As I close, doesn't mean it's not available. Because it was available to Adam and Eve. But they slapped the hand of reconciliation away by not owning their crap and leaning into the very same person that was there. The very same God that was there who created them could have restored them. So what do we do? I'm going to read this last thing here. I have time. 1230, right? Okay. <laughs> so I'm trying to be, trying to be, hey, I'm up, good by my time. Okay. So. This was written by a pastor, Robert McShane, who was a pastor in Scotland around the 18, he was born 1813, he died in 1843. He preached at a church for about six years and died in it, like, when he was 29. When he, laid, when he was laid to rest, about 7,000 people came to his funeral because he had touched that community with the grace of God so deeply. And he wrote this. He died, I want to say he died, forgive me. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot what he died from. I apologize. But he died sick. And it said, he wrote this, he said, I was once a stranger is the name of it. I was once a stranger to the grace of God. I knew not my danger and felt not my load. Though friends spoke in rapture of Christ on the tree, Jehovah's sit canoe was nothing to me. I oft read with pleasure to soothe or engage, talking about the Bible, how much he read it, Isaiah's wild measure and John's simple page. But even when they pictured the blood-sprinkled tree, Jehovah's Sid canoe seemed nothing to me. Like tears from the daughters of Zion that roll, I wept when the waters went over his soul, yet thought not that sins, excuse me, yet thought not that my sins had nailed to the tree. Jehovah's Sid canoe was nothing to me. But when grace, when free grace awoke me by light from on high, then legal fear shook me, I trembled to die. No refuge, no safety in self I could see. Jehovah sit canoe, my savior must be. My terrors all vanished before the sweet name. My guilty fears banished with boldness I came. To drink at the fountain life-giving and free, Jehovah sit canoe is all things to me. Jehovah Sid Canoe, my treasure and boast. Jehovah Sid Canoe, I never can be lost. In thee I shall conquer by flood and by field, my cable, my anchor, my breastplate, my shield. Even treading the valley, the shadow of death, this watchword shall rally my faltering breath. For, for while from life's fever my God sets me free, Jehovah Sid Canoe, my death song shall be. He didn't think Jehovah Sidkenu, righteousness was necessary. Because if you read through the poem, he tells you the, the journey of who he was. And in the beginning, he even read the Bible and Isaiah and John, how cool it was. But Jehovah Sidkenu wasn't a point for him. I, even if he heard, my sins died on the tree, for what? But when he realized that he also needed to be redeemed, he went from Jehovah Sidkenu means nothing to me. Jehovah Sidkenu takes me through my dying breath. He died restored. But his body was broken, but his spirit man restored. So the question I ask you, as we close, the question I ask you, if you die to be 112, or if you pass away from some disease, God is a healer. He is a restorer. So we can stand indeed for you. But like him, if that happens, or if you die 70 years from now, will you have let him restore you? 
because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, starting with me. We are all broken. We all need a savior. We're all disjointed until we accept him. And then he does the work for you. He is like the husband that buys the land, has the house, has the money, has the cars, has everything laid out for you. Your future is secure if you accept his hand in marriage. And he's offering it to you. Free. You don't have to join this church. We're glad to have you, but you don't have to. That's not what gets you the free gift. Get your friendship, kind people, but not eternal salvation. You don't have to change political parties. You don't have to change your clothes, your outfits, whether you wear a skirt or pants. You don't have to change any of that, but you do have to change the partner you're dancing with eternally. You do have to change spouses from being married to Satan to accepting Christ. So please close your eyes with me. We're going to give everybody the same chance and repeat after me. No embarrassment, just Christ. Say, Jesus, I've heard about you. I've learned things about you along my life's way. I'm broken. You see things nobody else knows. Things I, I hope nobody else knows. But I need change. I'm suffocating in this. I want you. I hear you can help. I hear you can change me. I give myself to you. Change me, Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of the things I've done, the things I've said, the choices I've made that have pushed me away from you. I come to you now. Thank you for taking this broken person and restoring me unto you. I accept you, Christ. I accept your hand in marriage. Amen. I want to tell you something. Just like salvation is just like marriage. You don't come to this altar, the justice of peace, anywhere. I don't care if you got married on a volcano side somewhere in, in Maui. If you say those vows there and then walk away from that person forever, you're legally hitched, but you're not married. You may have legal documentation, but that doesn't mean you're intimately married. If you make a decision here today, pursue him. Because he's hot on your trail. Meet him halfway. He loves you. Scars and all. He's got gold for your broken pieces. If anyone said that and you accepted him, you are not alone. We are here with you and for you, standing with you. At the service, the Freedom Team will be up here. We encourage you to come up here and speak with people and say, hey, I'm, I'm who he was talking about. I want change. Can you help point me to him? And we are here for you and with you.